When the fires crest the horizon, when a great host casts a pall over the land, when the enemy themselves surrounds the walls, who can be called upon to man the ramparts? Who will be mankind's citadel incarnate, whose standard will be borne aloft for all to look upon and feel their hearts swell? The great crusade and the thrice-damned heresy gave humanity their answer. The standard is the emblem of the mailed fist, its bearers crested with the laurels of ancient victory. Know then that this is a record of the last wall, humanity's stalwart shield, the Seventh Legion, Imperial Fists. Upon the Crucible of Terra, alongside their many brother legions, the Seventh Legion saw their inception in the atrocities of the Unification Wars. While their fellow proto-legions would draw recruits from specific regions, such as Old Albion in the case of the 14th Legion, or the Terran Underhive prison complexes in the case of the 8th, the 7th adopted the entire planet as their crucible. This was unusual in and of itself, and was made more so by the Legion's insistence on drawing neophytes from areas including those claimed by other legions. In the vast majority of cases, the Seventh Applied Testing intended to sift out those candidates possessed of even higher levels of endurance than those selected by other legions. These men would also be markedly taciturn, but possessed of iron convictions when the time came for them to act. It has been theorized that this singular recruitment process is down to the incredibly painful nature of the Astartes elevation process when employing the gene seed of the Seventh and that the Legion was simply ensuring that they could obtain the largest selection of inductees for a process that they had come to realize would be even more taxing on the human psyche than that of other Legions. It is also possible that the roving nature of their biologist Thrall personnel was an early unification era affectation, which later developed into a tradition. Whatever the reason, the dour candidates who were elevated to the ranks of the Legion's Astartes were perfectly suited for the role it found itself serving. The philosophy of the Seventh Legion was rather particular to that of their fellows. All who served in the Emperor's armies knew the ultimate goal of their endeavor, the unity of Terra for the first time in millennia, and beyond, the unity of humanity for the first time in history. The extent to which they participated in this goal, however, differed amongst the Legion as Astartes. Some legions were content to be merely pointed in a direction and let loose, as with the Bellicose 6th and 12th legions, butchers who simply moved on once their targets had been bloodied beyond recognition. For others, the purpose was simply annihilation, to which we can look at the chem and rad-soaked wastelands the 14th legion left in their trail, or surgical excision of a problem, as with the operations carried out by the 19th and 20th legions. Not so for the Seventh. Their philosophy was rooted in not simply claiming the field for the Emperor, but in holding it in perpetuity. A foe could be bested, but still harbour resentment or hatred in his heart. A land could be conquered, but still remain exposed, the prime target for the enemies of the Imperium. The Seventh Legion would not countenance such weaknesses. Upon the field of battle, they would bear any blood toll a war exacted, and upon the advent of victory, immediately consolidate their hard-won gains. The Legion raised great bastions in the lands they conquered, driving earthworks deep into the roots of the world, so that none who gazed upon them could doubt that these were the lands of man and its master. This pattern was repeated in whichever Terran theatre they fought in, raising the fortress of the Fifth Circle from the ruins of the cities of the Crystal Sea, and setting the first imperial bastions on the atmosphere-piercing peaks of the Himalaya, having lost three whole battalions of Astartes in their campaign against the psychic Windcaller clans. In their first decade of active service, the Legion raised over 600 bastions across the homeworld. Those Terrans inhabiting the conquered lands would ghoulishly remark that the Legion built their fortresses upon the bones of the fallen, and if the Seventh had any thoughts on such poetic commentary, their dour countenances would never reveal their true feelings upon the matter. It is likely that this was counted as a grim honour, a testament to their dedication to the cause. 
Their expanding web of citadels connected the lands they conquered, lodestones for the promulgation of the imperial truth, and supremely confident reminders of the omnipresence of the new order. It has been remarked upon by other chroniclers that the Seventh Legion embody the Emperor's designs for the unification of Terra, and indeed humanity more than any other, crusaders in the most potent form of the word. Not simply silent Castellans, their conquests moved apace with armies they fought alongside, ever relentless in their pursuit of new lands for the master of mankind, expanding the frontiers of the nascent Imperium even as they secured what had been conquered. Similarities have been drawn to the actions of the 17th Legion, who often lingered after the front lines had advanced to nurture the seeds of the Imperial ideology within subjugated populations, although it has been demonstrated time and time again that the pace of the 7th vastly outstripped their cousins. Mass hammer-blow assaults involving multiple battalions of Astartes typified the actions of the 7th Legion during the Unification Wars. Unsubtle, yes, but effective as they ground their enemies to dust under the heels of their power armor, regardless of the cost incurred. The oft-repeated maxim amongst those who gazed upon their works has been rendered to memory as if the hand of the Emperor had descended and gripped with an unbreakable fist. This must have pleased the Master of Mankind, for in honor of their hard-won victories, he granted unto the Seventh Legion the ancient Romani honor of the victory laurels, and bequeath them with the name, the Imperial Fists. Even before they took to the stars, the Seventh Legion had a name to their own, and were possessed of purpose inviolate. It is well remarked upon in how the Primarchs embody, in almost every way, the characteristics and humors of their Legion, how the gene seed infusing the bodies of their sons bears with it shades of the progenitor's own self. In certain cases, such as with the 12th and 6th legions, the reunion of legion and primarch led to a profound shift in character. In the case of the imperial fists, however, their reunion with their father could not have had a more focused effect, strengthening those virtues and values so hard won upon Terra in the early crusade. On Inwit, the capital planet of the Inwit cluster, the Imperium and the 7th legion were reunited with Rogel Dorn. The infant Dorn had fallen upon a world of ice and death, orbiting a withered husk of a dying star. The cold bled into every fabric of Inwit, where even the light side of the tidally locked world scraped barely any heat from the wan light of the fading sun. There was little in the way of life upon the world. Under the ice, Pale sea creatures eked out lives of perpetual night amongst thermal vents. Fur-clad beasts roamed the snowy plains. In the vast mountain ranges, and higher still in the aurora-shrouded orbit, Inwit's human population clung to existence in the ancient hive cities and orbital space stations. Relics millennia old, these ancient structures had endured since Inwit's more prosperous past. Even as the human population shrank and regressed, the technology designed to survive the planet's harshness had borne out the years, a testament to humanity's lost ingenuity. Inwit itself possessed little in the way of tangible value. Its crust contained no great mineral bounty, and its lands made large-scale agriculture impossible. But, as with many worlds later rendered unto Astartes legions as recruiting fiefs, Inwit's true value lay in its human population. During the long dark of old night, the population had regressed to a tribal society, albeit a technologically competent one. Able to fully maintain and operate the age-old structures of their homeworlds, the humans of Inuit formed tightly knit clans dedicated to the preservation of the whole over the one. These people were as hardy as any in the galaxy, dour, stoic, and relentless in their dedication to survival and endurance. Weakness led only to death. A moment of laxity could lead to the heat seals of a clan hold failing, dooming those within to an icy death. Conflict between these nomadic clans was common as resources were scarce, and was occasionally sought after by clan warlords wishing to blood their younger warriors 
to weed out any potential weaknesses. As time progressed, those of Inuit took to their local space in crude but superbly functional spacecraft, extending the domains of the clans to the cluster of planets in near space. While each new world conquered brought the humans of Inuit new learning and better technology, the patriarchs and matriarchs of the clan held steadfast to the old ways, the ways that had given their people the strength to endure all that the galaxy could send at them. Dorne, discovered as a babe wandering the ice plains alone and unclothed, was taken under the wing of one such patriarch. Little is known of the Primarch's early years, and certainly the grim master of the Imperial Fists is loath to part with many details. The young Rogel's own character jibed well with his new homeworld. He could endure more privation than any human on Inwit, yet would always do so with utter selflessness when it came to the preservation of his clan. In a similar fashion to so many of his brothers, he rose through the ranks of his adopted society, becoming leader of his clan, then his continent, then his planet, until finally, Rogel Dorn was master of the entirety of Inuit's stellar empire. It was in this form the Emperor would find him, when forty years standard following the death of Rogel's foster grandfather, Imperial expeditionary fleets entered Inuit space. Dorn himself greeted the newcomers aboard the gigantic phalanx, an enormous starship constructed in the long-lost past of the Dark Age of Technology. Dorne was said to have pledged immediate fealty to the Emperor and entered Imperial service at the head of the Seventh Legion, as the Seventh Primarch rediscovered. Already the master of a stellar realm, Dorne needed little in the way of tutelage and took the reins of the Imperial Fists with one of the finest military minds the Imperium could count upon. The Great Crusade won the Imperial Fists many accolades as they emerged from the Unification Wars with zeal unbound and dedication unmatched. The pattern of conquer and fortify they had cleaved across Terra was now recreated on a galactic scale. Dorne was an idealist whose philosophy melted perfectly with that of his legion, yet his iron will exacted his sons to even greater feats. He was a harsh and uncompromising father, dour and silent at the best of times, and scant with praise. Seventh Legion legends tell of how he spoke not a word during his reunification with his sons, until he had seen them fight upon the field of battle, and even then he did it only to provide instruction. Yet those parsing this record should not be under the assumption that Dorn was an emotionless automata. Rather, he cared deeply for his legion and for the imperial cause, but his nature was one of stone, and stone is uncompromising. He would brook no weakness from his sons, and ever did they strive to show none. Few integrations of Primarch and Legion were accomplished as quickly as with the Seventh, or to such wondrous results for both. For the 160 years of the Crusade to follow, the Imperial Fists were ever at the Imperium's van, operating in much the same way they had on Terra, in their tried and trusted methods of conquest and fortification. Legion practice of leaving a Castellan and a small household of Astartes in the most vital or potentially tenuous regions did not extend to outright rulership. Dorn was famous for his maxim of wanting recruits, not vassals. Just one of the many barbed comments directed at his brother Pertoapo of the 4th Legion, Iron Warriors, whose indemnity will be recounted in a later record. Not for the 7th, was the rulership sought by their brothers of the 4th or 13th. Dorn is known to have debated its merits with his brother Rubute Goliman on the role of Primarchs as statesmen, and if the father of the 13th Legion made any impact upon Dorn's thinking, it did not show. The 7th remained soldiers, content and dedicated to their role as a military formation exclusively. As the crusade drew on, their stellar base aboard the Phalanx allowed them to operate as a strategic reserve, able to rapidly redeploy to wherever they were needed most, and their employment of the detailed slant and their employment of the detailed planning and stratagems demanded of their Primarch made them amongst the best urban warfare 
and siege specialists the Imperium could field. So great was their renown for the latter that Horus Lupercal, Primarch of the 16th Legion Luna Wolves, said that should the staunch defenders of the Imperial Fists ever face the unstoppable assault of his wolves upon the field, the resulting conflict would be the bloodiest stalemate imaginable, and last until the stars themselves dimmed. Only history has shown the dark irony these words would later hold. After the great triumph of Eulenor, where Horus ascended to his lofty position of war master, the Emperor had one more honour to bestow. In his retirement to Terra to pursue his greatest work, he bade his son Rogel Dorn to be his Praetorian, and the master of the greatest fortress yet to be built. To the Imperial Fists was charged the defence of the Imperial household upon Terra, and the fortification of the Imperial Palace itself. In his typical nature, Dorn accepted the task with grim devotion. Whereas other legions may have rankled to have had the vast majority of their forces confined to one system, one world, the Imperial Fists took it as the most singular honour their skills and expertise could receive, and made it once for Terra and their great task. But that, as with the dark days that would follow, is the body of another record entirely, and must wait for another time.